and sent an altar back to 1956 to later be in Montauk. That means the people in the 60s were in contact with the people in 2000s and ordered assets from the future. Yes, they're in contact with the future at all times um, and always have been. It's when you have time travel technology, time does not exist. So it's not even something that they would consider strange or remarkable in any way. And yeah, they were ordering people from the future. There were people who have still not even been born yet who were brought back. There were people from, I think, the 26th century, a family of them. Um, there was kind of a sense of timelessness in all of these bases that you'd, unless you saw a calendar, you would struggle to know what period you were in. Okay, so let's go to some of the operations. What do you remember that stands out most? Okay, so moving forward into um, the early stages, um, the very first memories I have of the operations themselves were ones in Egypt, uh, of all places, looking for artifacts that were ancient technology of varying kinds underground. They sent us well back in time to do this, but not so far back that it would have been in ancient Egypt. They sent us to probably, I guess, about the Victorian era, uh, or thereabouts, maybe a little earlier, in groups. There was a group of maybe 20 kids. It was a pretty big group, um, overseen by, again, Monovitz. Alex was using his capabilities to find these things that were underground. And he did... I couldn't tell you what they actually wound up doing. That was, of course, at that time, not, in his, not within his pay grade to know that what they actually were doing with it. But I can say they found, like, small gold pyramids. Um, they found a thing that looked very much... It was a, a half sphere that had another full sphere levitating inside of it, made out of, again, metal of some sort. I guess it looked like silver. Um, what that did, no idea. Um, and they found what I believe was a Saturn cube. Actually, several of what I believe were Saturn cubes from my own research afterwards and memories I've had otherwise since then. I can also remember that they found um, a lot of scrolls, interestingly, uh, that were in languages that are not of this earth, or at least all record of them has been wiped, but someone knew how to read them. Uh, while we were in Egypt, we were treated better than how we were on base, which is not saying much. Uh, I mean, we got, we had beds at least, or cots in tents, we didn't have to sleep in cages, and we got fed an amount that was necessary for us to be able to, you know, go out and work in the desert. There were still other things that happened to us, uh, beatings and so on. Uh, can you describe the sites you were at, and how did you find the artifacts, like the, the work process, and why did they need as many as 20 kids there? What did they do there? And how long did you guys stay there for? The sites, uh, the recognizable ones would have been Giza and Saqqara and um, the, uh, Luxor, um, specifically not the Valley of Queens, not the Valley of Kings, the Valley of Queens, I believe it was, and also Memphis. Um, three out of four of those are in the Cairo area. And um, we would... Uh, I think the reason for that many kids was just because these sites are so enormous. They wanted them. It was more efficient that way. Uh, and what we were doing was just walking over the ground and sensing. That's the only way I can think of to put it. Just sensing if there was anything under us. And if there was, uh, you would call out to Monovitz or to one of the adults who was there. And they would come over and uh, start a dig, start digging it. They had digging equipment, and that's how that went. Oh, we, how long were we there for? Um, we were there several times. The longest one was the time when we were at what is the site that is known as Saqqara, actually. We were there for well over a month, um, well over a month. Uh, most of the other times, we were only there for a few days to a week. Um, I think at Giza, we might have been there for maybe two weeks. But for the most part, we weren't there very long at all, um, compared to 
how a lot of other mission, a lot of the other missions and such that we did. And I think it was during that phase that they discovered the ability which wound up, which caused me slash Alex to be loaned out to Monarch Solutions temporarily uh, several years later, which I can, since it connects, I can tell the story here. Um, there were people who would come into Camp Hero and commit for quote-unquote talent. That was their uh, euphemism, of course, but really they were looking for was slave labor. Um, these were people from various programs, from Nachtwaffen, from Solar Warden, from many of the ICC companies, and so on, who would come in and take these kids for however long they wanted to, and then, of course, bring them back to Montauk. They had agreements struck up. They would buy out a portion of this kid's contract and pay exorbitant amounts of money to do this, which is how probably where a lot of the funding for Montauk came from in those days. About the combing process, um, you said that there were people from Solar Warden and Nachtwaffen and others, which of course brings us to the question of the time or outside of time nature of Montauk. So 1960s, the beginning of that, I guess it would, wouldn't be officially what people think when Solar Warden was around at that time, like it wasn't probably operational yet, or what you mean is people would come from other times to choose people and to pick them up? Yes, people did come from other times, um, past and future, uh, especially from the future they would come. Solar Warden did exist at the time, although it was not called that until 1982 or 83, or yeah, 83. Um, it was known as Project Mayflower. Um, but so I guess it would have just been naval intelligence people looking for people to partake in Project Mayflower or in other naval intelligence operations off world. And one of these people was Paul Serene himself, the head of Monarch Solutions. Uh, which is a, for people who don't know, is kind of a mercenary company, but they specialize in sex slaves. Paul Serene himself had a particular interest in artifacts from a civilization known as, more commonly, as the First Solar Empire. The capital was Tiamat, and it was, this empire fell and was destroyed in the Orion Wars. That's a whole, that's a topic for later. But Paul Serene was looking for artifacts for his own collection. This was not connected to his company. This was a personal thing that he wanted. And so he picked up me slash Alex and took us, took him to Centurion, uh, which is a planet I talk about in a lot of my interviews that is in Alpha Centauri. And it's not actually a planet, by the way. It's a Dyson Sphere, the outer layer of which was terraformed probably millions of years ago. And he had Alex there looking for these things for him. And he picked him up for that probably ten times or m more. It happened quite often. Between the years of 65 and 69, um, if Alex performed and found, the, found artifacts, particularly ones which looked like technology or scrolls, then he was treated quite well. He got to be put up in a hotel room on Centurion, he would get a steak dinner and all of that. If he did not perform well or at all, he would be starved and he would sleep outside in a cage in the mud, uh, in the jungle. Yeah. So those are the early things which stand out. Oh, um, another thing, they had Alex remote viewing uh, targets a lot of different targets, uh, particularly in the Eastern Bloc, Cuba, especially, also Russia, Hungary, China, Vietnam, those sorts of things, very typical uh, sorts of things you would expect from that era. Another question is, Preston Nichols, in his testimony, uh, was talking about how they actually used Nazi gold to fund the project. It was gold bullions with supposedly even the German eagles on them. Do you remember anything about this and the funding of the project? Any kind of, you said that they paid a lot of money to buy assets there. 
Do you remember how the deals were struck and what was used and how all of that process took place? I am aware of the Nazi gold. Um, it was used to some degree, yes, um, to fund. However, they could not have possibly funded such a massive undertaking with just one shipment worth of gold. I think they used that um, actually to pay people who worked for them uh, to some degree. There were some people who worked there who got paid, such as um, the groups who would go out and kidnap kids for them, which was, by the way, there was a euphemism for that too, which was supply runs, which is lovely. But that's where that comes into play. I think him saying that was the only thing is yet another case of Preston covering his own ass um, after the fact. Because I think that money gotten from the kids they sold, and also funding from the military, or militaries of the world, were their main sources of income. How it worked out was, uh, these people, the people who were combing would come in, they had um, a piece of paper, or not a piece of paper, sorry, a book, that had lists of names, and what these kids could do how they got this, I assume that Montauk was selling this around uh, periodically whenever they got in a new shipment and knew what these kids could do. And so these people would show up, go around picking up kids who fit the criteria for what they were looking for. They would interview them to see if they also had, well, sometimes they would, sometimes they would not. Sometimes if it was something that required a personality of a specific type, then yeah, they would do the interviews. And then they would, uh, I don't know how the payments were actually done. I remember once overhearing a conversation that it was being wired, but who was doing the wiring, where it was wired to, I don't know. I guess Tiamat, another name for it would be Maldek, uh, the big planet that is now the asteroid belt. Yes, you are correct. That is uh, the other name for Tiamat is Maldek, with the planet that is now the asteroid belt, yes. So, looking for these Solar Empire artifacts, Maldek year artifacts, what did you have to do? Where did you have to go to? What kind of artifacts were there? And why did you say you failed sometimes? What would happen? I, I assume you would have to go back hundreds of thousands of years, like there is different... Uh, opinions of when it happened. Some say it was 500,000 years, some say it was as far back as a million years or even more. How long ago it happened? Um, I think about 500,000 years ago. I know we were going back in time somewhat to find these artifacts, but it was not when this empire still existed. It was still well after that. We were going to this planet Centurion, or this really it's actually a Dyson Sphere, um, about five times the size of Earth, I would say. But it's now basically just a jungle planet because, as I mentioned, the outer shell of it was terraformed and made habitable. And it was, again, just walking along and sensing things that were buried. I would fail sometimes because sometimes they would dig something up and it would be completely useless, like a block of wood or an empty box or something like that. And Oh, the other part was, what did we find? Um, again, it was technology. There were a lot of small pyramids, little hand size, you know, you could fit in the palm of your hand, pyramids made of different materials, um, some metal, some crystal. There was something that looked very much like a, a small computer, uh, or a laptop, really. I don't know how they were planning to use that, because it was corroded, but apparently they had some way of reviving it or getting what was on on it but the biggest amount of stuff that uh, I found there was scrolls and again of course I could not read them I could not tell you what they were but they were apparently quite valuable and useful I guess the Eastern Bloc missions would be of a specific interest to my audience. Anything you can remember of interest, any details, any places I guess and the nature of the operations we found was that there, a lot of their projects were quite similar to ours in a lot of ways. There was, in fact, one that was nearly identical to Montauk that operated out of um, rural Hungary, I believe. And 
out of a base in rural Hungary. Uh, who knows, it may still be going on. But we sent several sleeper agents there. Um, I was never one of them, to be clear. I just knew that this was happening. But I do remember going on assassination ops. Locations that I specifically remember would be Vladivostok in Siberia. I don't know how exactly how far that is from where you're located, but... And um, Havana in Cuba, uh, and another small town in Cuba where Alex actually lived for several years um, undercover. He got a false identity, a false Cuban identity, and learned to speak flawless Cuban Spanish and lived there. Pretty much just spying on this one man who lived in this little town who was, yeah, an undercover telepath for the Cuban government who would, um, he wouldn't remote view exactly to spy on the states. What he would do was, uh, covertly, telepathically contact someone without their knowledge of it and then use that connection to see and hear things through their brain. How Montauk found out about it, why this fell under their, their jurisdiction and not just the CIA or whatever, I don't know. You know, they didn't explain their decision making to... Can you tell more details about the Hungarian mission? Details of the Hungarian mission? Okay, there were two Hungarian missions that I have lengthy recall of. One of them was under Kyle, so we'll talk about that when and if we do a shows about Kyle, because that one is um, a lot longer. The other one was just, we were inserted into, um, I believe the KGB or the Hungarian equivalent. This was in probably the 50s or early 60s. More Cold War stuff, spying on their time travel program, which was a rival to Montauk or Project Phoenix. It was pretty much identical, in fact, although it was um, sm much smaller in scale, I would say. And it was at a base. I don't know the name of the base, if it's even a place I could find records of. Uh, it was in, I know, the north of Hungary. Pretty remote. There was a regular base on the surface, and there was another one below it, a, a dumb, that had this program in it. And again, we were just observing and gathering intel. Uh, I know that they also sent sleeper agents there to eventually carry out assassinations and sabotage missions there, but that was not what we were doing, me and the few people I was with. Uh, we were doing something entirely different. We were just intel gathering and reporting back what we saw. And I know that one of us, a female, was made and executed, which, and that was the end of her. She is um, one of the quote-unquote lost boys of Montauk who died uh, on, during an operation. And by the way, that's a gender-neutral term. Uh, we used it for both boys and girls. About the nature of these programs, um, we knew that the Eastern Bloc, or specifically the Soviet Union really, because there were China and Vietnam and places, you know, the non-European Eastern Bloc countries were different. But Russia and its satellite states, I guess you could say, were in alliance predominantly with the Tau Ceti, which are, they look pretty much like Vulcans uh, from Star Trek, actually, funnily enough. And I believe some of those countries still have that alliance. Um, Ukraine, I know, still continues to have that alliance. Russia has switched to uh, other alliances. And um, China, I know, was allied with a gray species from Betelgeuse, which are quite nasty. Uh, they're kind of... They're one of the big supporters of the galactic slave trade. The Betelgeusians, I believe that's how you would... the proper diminutive are. Uh, Vietnam was allied with uh, the Arcturians. And I believe Vietnam is still in that, is still under their sphere of influence. And they were finding these technologies, the technologies, a lot of it was in trade deals, but a lot of it also came from ancient sites within those countries, particularly within the Urals. 
there are a number of quite enormous caches of ancient ET texts that have been left behind because the Ural Mountains are actually pyramids and pyramids are for one thing pyramids house stargates and for another thing they house they're often used to store valuables one mission that particularly stands out is uh, Vladivostok like I mentioned to assassinate this guy who turned out to not be human he had that thing that some Draco do where they put up a telepathic screen over themselves where they look human and even feel human I've heard that some of them can do it so well that you could be having sex with one and you would not know because their psi ability to cover themselves is that strong but this guy we uh, hid I, I'm not sure if it was I think it was on the side of a hill on the edge of town although it might have been on the roof of a building I'm not super crystal clear on that and sniped him took him out and when the bullet went through him he died instantly and he fell to the ground and instantly his telepathic screen vanished and we had to run in and grab the body before anyone else saw it and uh, possibly caused an uproar that's one that really stands out in my head okay the Ural Mountains can you say what year you went to uh, and if it was current, I mean, within the this uh, century, how would you prepare for the mission to be, did you portal there to, you know, where there is no one around, you, you didn't have to interact or you would have to mingle and maybe speak Russian or something? I mean, both the Urals and Vladivostok. And can you say everything you remember about the places, the nature of the artifacts and stuff like that? In the Ural Mountains, no, we did not interact with anyone. Uh, that I can recall. Um, well, no, I take that back. We did interact with several non-human people, tall, several tall whites who were there. Um, this was in an extremely remote part. They could come and go in small ships and have a small little settlement there that was just underground and no one would have, no one knew. And they were our guides around the place. We did not see another human soul anywhere uh, that I can recall. In Vladivostok, yes, we did have to uh, interact because we were in we were in uh, the city, following this guy around, um, learning his routine, trying to find a place and time when he would be the most vulnerable to be taken out. So, yes, in that time we did speak Russian. I believe that at Montauk they had some kind of a technology to download a language into your brain because I don't recall any kind of language learning classes whatsoever. That time period was in the 70s, the or maybe late 60s. I, it was unmistakable because uh, of from the clothes people were wearing and uh, and we stayed in a hotel and it had very very 60s or early 70s decor. The Ural Mountains, I could not even begin to tell you what time period that was, quite honestly. It could have been any time and oh and how we got there yeah we would just portal in we portaled into in Vladivostok we did it into an alleyway uh, really shielded from the buildings around it in such a way that unless you were standing in the alleyway you wouldn't see anything and in the Urals we just portaled in out in the open uh, well not out in the open it was in the middle of some woods but like I said it was completely and totally cut off from the outside world in the Urals. Okay, the Urals. I can only remember going there the one time. We stayed there for probably a year, if not more so. Um, I don't recall seeing any mummies, but interestingly I do remember seeing some people in stasis of various species. Some of them looked like us. They probably weren't. They were probably some other species of human that just looks like us, but there were others. There were dwarf-like creatures or people they weren't creatures people and there were several different kinds of greys um oh and there were several uh geminites people from the constellation gemini which they look pretty much like us but they have dark purple skin they're actually very pretty and the only inscriptions that i saw were in their language they were on the sides of these 
stasis chambers, and they were in this Geminite language, which uh, I have a photograph that, that someone in the SSP community uh, had, I guess, done some auto writing, and it was in that language. Um, I'll see if I can find it and send it to you. Can you say what artifacts you found in the Urals and why did you have to stay there for over a year? I remember a lot of scrolls um, and a lot of um, just devices, handheld devices that I couldn't tell you the nature of because um, the tall white technicians were the only ones who knew how to do that. And it took so long because there was so much of it and we were recording the history as well. We were recording stuff that was written on the wall. We were recording everything. Um, it wasn't just a raid. It was an archaeological dig. You know, archaeologists take months or years of their digs too when they find a new site. So, yeah, that was what, why it took so long. Yeah, since, since we talked about the alien races, uh, the tall whites that you named, there are different versions of how they are supposed to look like. Some say that they're like tall greys, basically, and just white and tall. <laughs> Others, like, you know, the Charles Hall uh, version of the Nellis uh, Air Force Base in near Area 51 there says they're completely human, just paper white skin, uh, white hair and stuff like that. Uh, what were the tall whites in your program? Mine are closest to the Charles Hall version, but uh, they're not the same size as us. They're the ones that I've seen anyway have been 12 to 15 feet tall, but yeah, extremely white skin, very thin and wraith like, and they wear long flowing robes. Um, we were told that they are actually the same as the Anunnaki. I don't know if that's true. I can't confirm or deny the veracity of that claim either way, but that's what we were told by the Air Force officials in charge of uh, Camp Hero. Yes, this is great corroboration. Penny told me in 2019, she said that they were the Anunnaki, but just a lower caste, a worker caste, and they were they are all over the place in the Western countries right now. and. Uh, uh, there was a tall white base on Mars when she was there also, um, and they're quite arrogant uh, towards humans because they consider themselves, of course, you know, at least being our superior and in some cases even being, you know, gods to uh, compare to us. Did I interact with them? Absolutely. I, across multiple altars of mine, heavy interactions, uh, and they, there were several who were at Camp Hero. Um, and there were the ones I mentioned who were in the Urals. Uh, what were they like? For the most part, they're very arrogant, like she's mentioned, but like that's not the word for it. Um, they treat you like you're a dog shit stain on their most expensive shoes. Like that's really and truly the best way to put it. That's how they look at you, that's how they tend to talk to you like uh, they don't really like us. Um, but for whatever reason, some of them are assisting with the SSP. I don't know what their reasoning is for this. That's about what I could say. I mean, like I said, there were frequent interactions, which I still occasionally happen, by the way, because I'm still very much active and being sent on missions, and they're not an uncommon sight uh, for, in certain circles, they're not an uncommon sight at all. And since we touched upon that, you know, about this theory about Tartaria that goes around, that there was uh, exactly around this region, I mean, the Urals and the middle of the Russia uh, and uh, over there to the east, this empire being, being there, was there any mention back then about this or it's a later thing? There was a considerable mention of Tartaria, actually, as it happens. Um, we learned what we were told was that it had fallen pretty much in the late 1500s or early 1600s and that it was not the global empire that a lot of people now theorize it was where it had spread to like america and china and across europe and north africa and australia and all that no their technology did make it out to some extent their thing of building particularly these buildings that could harness energy using spires i guess is the term that was fairly widespread. The center of it was in 
the area that now uh, borders Russia and Kazakhstan, which I know nowadays a lot of that is pretty much a no man's land. So they've very successfully removed um, whatever was left. Uh, but that's what we knew about it. And uh, they did, people exaggerate it to an extent. They did have free energy in their buildings, yes. Especially in public buildings, not so much in houses, but in public buildings. They did not, however, have airships, like some people say. They did not, they were not a telepathic society, like I've seen some people suggest, but they were quite advanced for their time. Okay, how did you find all this out about Tartaria? Did you guys go there? Did you have any briefings? We went there uh, on a number of occasions, um, mostly just... Uh, well, again, little bits of sabotage. We would uh, go and steal documents of various kinds. We would um, to take people out again, all of that sort of thing. But we were there fairly often because, I mean, it's more or less the technological height of that region, uh, unless you're talking about like Atlantean times or whatever. But in fairly recent history, that's pretty much the peak that they've reached uh, publicly anyway. Of course, they're SSPs are way beyond that, but, you know, that's a different story. What else do you remember about Tartaria? What languages did they speak? How long did you stay there? And what artifacts did you bring back? I don't remember that much else about Tartaria in general. Um, what language did they speak? I believe that the main spoken languages were Kazakh and Russian, from what I can recall, but I'm sure in regions there were, that they spoke regional languages you know, as people in those areas do today. How long did you stay there and what was the purpose? That depends on which operation there you're talking about. A number of times it was simply just intel gathering. That was uh, a lot of the time what Alex was there, just observing how things progressed and then someone else might go in after him and sabotage it. But he rarely partook in that. Sometimes he did. Um, I can recall sabotage missions, sabotaging the uh, the civilization, going in and burning down cities and things like that. Awful stuff, really. Um, pretty fucked up, but that was basically what we did. And any artifacts that were brought back, um, not that I can specifically recall, perhaps, perhaps we might have brought back some blueprints or some manuscripts. I don't recall taking back anything more solid than that. 